Introducing health and wellness advocate, veteran international real estate investment expert, author and speaker, Adiel Gurel. Health tips, fitness tips, nutrition and well-being, world-class experts, all right here on my podcast, The Adiel Gurel Show. And welcome back to the Adi El Gorel Show, everybody. We are continuing the interview on this episode with Dr. Nathan Bryan. And Adi El, some of the stuff that um, you were talking to Dr. Bryan about in the first interview, uh, for, and this is for those who may have missed the first interview as well, was quite transformative in, in, in my thinking, at least. I mean, there were things I just took for granted that I assumed were safe. Uh, things like brushing my teeth with fluoride toothpaste, gargling with mouthwash, um, eating cured meats, you know, all these things, some I thought were healthy, some I thought were unhealthy. And in this interview, it's like he reversed it. It's like, actually, the toothpaste is dangerous. The pepperoni's not. <laughs> no, Confusing. no, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. Let, let's say. The, tooth, the toothpaste is not dangerous. I know it sounds like a nice, you know, like a good slogan, you know, but the toothpaste is not dangerous. It's the fluoride that it may include, as well as the, you know, the antiseptic mouthwashes, which can disrupt the bacteria in our mouth. The pepperoni is not good. The pepperoni is not good. It, it, and that, in fact, he was saying specifically for us not to confuse you know, the pepperoni with the green veggies. So the green veggies create nitrites that they break into nitrates or whatever, you know, the mechanism is. I don't want to sound like an expert because I'm not. But there is a misconception because the cured meats, the pepperoni that are, are the associated nitrates. with the word nitrites. Yeah. So people hear it that oh, nitrites are bad for you. And in fact, he was saying no. The pepperoni is not good for you. <laughs> <laughs> I love the slogan, but no, it's not. But what if I wanted to just eat pepperoni? I mean, you know, once in a while. I'm sure it's not, you know, the end of the world. So, so you know, um, the, the thing, there was an episode in a horrible one, you know, Game of Thrones can be incredibly brutal and harsh. Yeah. So there was an episode there where the horrible young kid who is a king, there, there's a guy there and he said, okay, I'll give you a choice. I'll either cut off your fingers or your tongue. Hmm. What kind of a choice is that? So, I mean, here, if somebody held a gun to your head and said, Chad, okay, you're either going to wash your mouth with a fluoride a toothpaste and use, uh, you know, antiseptic mouthwash, or you're going to eat the pepperoni all the time, right? That's kind of it. But you don't have to. You don't. You really it's don't. It's not that you I, now I use, I've been using Tom's toothpaste for years, and it doesn't have fluoride. Yeah. Well, Tom's is what I use also. Yeah. And Tom's actually have they have a, a, a toothpaste with fluoride and without. So I use the ones without, as do you, not surprising. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, I mean, that we have to be careful because there's a lot of it around. And in, in, in some places in the world, the tap water- It's in the water, which fluoride. never made sense to me, to be honest, because I know Dr. Brian talked about how it's a known neurotoxin. And um, why do we have to drink fluoride? I mean, that doesn't even make sense. Well, you know, at least let's just think about it from a logical point, just logic. Apparently the claim is that fluoride is good for your teeth. Let's just say that, it, let's say. So wouldn't it make sense to at least bring it in, gargle with it and spit it out? Why does it yeah. have to touch the teeth for a microsecond on the way to our stomach? Yeah. Last I checked, my digestive system didn't have teeth that needed whitening. <laughs> so it's associations just, of all kinds of organs uh, yeah. you know, that have teeth in movies that I don't even want. <laughs> but, you know, it's just so. But this is the thing is that um, experts like Dr. Brian and other ones that we're interviewing on these podcasts, um, you know, the 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 intent here is that we can't always trust 
what sort of the old thinking is, you know, that's just always been around. I mean, look at the food guides that, you know, government puts out and they do it like once every 40 years. And over that time, like lots has changed in, in that food guide, but so many people don't know where to go, where to find the information, how to make an uh, uh, informed decision. So the, the intent here is to, to just bring the people to you, bring the experts to you, you listen, you decide for yourself, talk to your doctor, what makes the most sense for you. Um, but you know, hopefully you're not in a city where you have to drink fluoride and, and if you are, you might want to consider another alternative than drinking out of the tap. Right. Right. So, um, normally people, he said, I mean, I, I want to see what he says in the next interview with him about, is there something that's a bit of a shortcut? We live in Western society, we like a pill, we like a shortcut, we'd like something. Let's see if he has anything like that. But clearly he talks about, once again, exercising. Nothing new, nothing new. Uh, leafy green veggies, nothing new here, nothing new. Uh, I wanna bring the question of fruit. He, mm. he specifically uh, talked about leafy green vegetables and veggies in general. I wanna see what, where fruits fall on this spectrum and specifically to talk about this veggie that has been known to almost be associated with uh, a um, nitric oxide, the beet. See yeah. what he says about beets. But again, remember in the book, he talked about that the arginine pathways uh, may not be relevant for most people beyond a certain age, maybe even your youthful age already, I'm not sure, but uh, we, we'll, we'll bring that up again. Let me tell you something though, that I've experienced. Cause I just, you know, even today I had a, a shake and I remember Dr. Brian saying that, but today I added L-arginine to my shake cause I've been doing it for years. There was a time when I didn't, and then I went back and I can tell you that there was an absolute difference for me when I was working out with L-arginine oh. versus when I didn't have it. Oh. I had way more energy. I felt like I was in the flow and like there was something going on. It's very, very obvious. It's, it's uh, not subtle at all. Um, so, you know, I, for me, the jury's still out on that. I heard what he said on that, but I'm still somewhat unconvinced, you know, that, um, that, that, that might be the case. So anyway, but well, you know, it's, it's not okay. Let, I think we're talking about two things here. Uh, you know, L-arginine may have benefits related to what you described, but when it comes to nitric oxide, yeah, 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 it's been almost like the go-to word for nitric oxide. And he was reminding us in the book. Let's see what he says about yeah. it. Yeah, talk to him that uh, as we age the arginine pathway for nitric oxide is not as effective, which is, you know, good to hear. Also, nit uh, the arginine pathway, there is something where I think 95% of all humanity has a herpes simplex one. Mm -hmm. I think that's the one that you get a sores on your mouth or on your lips. Mm. Herpes simplex one. And 95% of society has it? That's what I read, but it could have been wrong. But Even if it's 70%, that's... No, that's... that's well, I... You know what? We should look it up. Somebody okay. said 95, but let's go with 70. Let's go with 70. So it's a high percentage of yeah, that's... people have herpes simplex one. Now... There is another subset of people, not necessarily the same subset, who have herpes simplex two, which I think is known as genital, you know, herpes, and that's maybe mm -hmm. order of you know the, you know the popular. And then there is another. This is a whole family of herpes viruses. One of them is when people get shingles, right? Sometimes some some people get shingles. That's a that's. That's a herpes virus. I don't remember the name. Is it herpes zoster? Whatever. And then I think there is another unpleasant guy from the family. It's like a family of 
the viruses that between all of them together, almost every human would have one of them, you know. Okay. Yeah. And by the way, just for the record, because I just looked it up because I thought I'd check, 67% of the world population under 50 has HSV1. Okay, 67. So, yeah. so where did I get the 95? Probably from somebody who was counting everything. HSV1, HSV2, zoster, whatever. Or, or it could be, this is age 50 or under. Oh. Okay. So there's still people above 50. That hey, you know, age 50 and over... It's the summer of love, baby. Come on, you know? Percent is going to be higher, right? Yeah, and this is why no one wants to talk about that. Right. So <laughs> anyway, the reason I brought it up is apparently hmm. if somebody has one of these viruses dormant in their system, yeah. the two uh, amino acid, lysine and arginine, lysine suppresses it. Mm. Arginine brings it out, encourages it. Interesting. So, yeah. So it's not only that the arginine pathway for nitric oxide creation may be more limited as you go on in years, but it may be that some people would be reluctant to take an arginine supplement mm. without at least balancing it out with lysine. Yeah. Which I think lysine has some, you know, antiviral properties. Although in a very ironic way, nitric oxide has a lot of antiviral property, but some people would actually not want to take, uh, you know, arginine for that reason. Yeah. So, uh, you know, arginine is suspect from that standpoint and from the standpoint that Dr. Brian says in his book, it's, it's um, not as effective. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a perfect example, you know, because I put it in my shake and, I have a personal experience of its, for me, positive effect. But this is a perfect example for our viewers. You might be doing something. It's not, nothing's really ever black or white, you know, right or wrong, absolute. And so you have to listen and decide for yourself, is this something that you want to take an action around, stop doing or start doing or whatever. So for myself, the jury's still out. I still use it in my protein shakes because I know it has an effect. But I did, you know, I, I am hearing what you're saying that he writes about in the book. And, and, and so I'm eager to hear what his real explanation is around this and see if he can yeah. write it again. Yeah. And, you know, also one thing that we all have to remember, Chad, is we read, we get our data from research. We get our data from science. We get our data from doctors. But you always have to look at what's behind the data. Are there financial interests behind Money. this data? Yeah. Are there a companies who finance the seemingly perfect research and they clearly have an agenda? So, I mean, people nowadays, we have an overload of information mm -hmm. and everything is, you know, at our fingertips. And yet we have another burden now to verify the information. Everybody likes to talk about fake news and all of that stuff. That applies in every domain. Everything, yeah. Yeah, yeah so absolutely. Hopefully, for myself, for you, for our viewers, hopefully we can just get at the bottom of what is actually useful to us. Yeah. Let me give you an example. A, and that is only psychological, but it's still. I read some of the material from... Uh, the guy who writes the bulletproof books. Oh yeah, Dave, Dave Asprey. Asprey. Yeah, he's in Silicon Valley. Yeah. He's one of those people who started out, according to him, in bad shape. Mm -hmm. He was, you know, overweight, and then dramatic changes for the for the better. Which, yeah, we, but I I read his material. I I still really like the guy a lot. I think he's one of those people. He calls himself, I think, a biohacker. He, he does, likes yeah. to go out and research. He likes to be, you know, his own guinea pig. And it's lovely. And he even makes a lot of products now under the um, Bulletproof uh, uh, name. So I use his uh, Brain Octane Fuel every morning in my coffee. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> brain Octane Fuel. But w the, the bigger the business became, and they send me those... 
the more skeptical I was when I read his recommendations because a part of my brain said, is he recommended this because he sells it in his car? You know, that's only normal. It's very possible that his intentions are pure and he has amazing stuff. There's a lot to learn from him. Sure. Uh, and then there is this guy who I also really like, um, Ben Greenberg, I think his name is. Mm -hmm. He's younger. I think he's not even 40 yet, or maybe just about 40. And once again, he's super interested. He has everything at his home. We should interview both of these people, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and then there is another guy, um, the guy who wrote the four hour work week. Work week, Timothy Ferris. Yeah, Timothy Ferris. So he's also, I think he's in the Bay Area. And yeah. it seems to be, he too is a seeker. Yeah. I know I'm into the kettlebells and he went and took the kettlebell training course and, you know, mm. you know, with Pavel. And so, I mean, all of those people are fascinating. I hope we get to speak with them and interview them as well. Yeah, but, I'm I mean, sure we Even with them, even with, with the Bulletproof, sometimes you say, well, he's selling it at the same time. Yeah. You know, that's the same skepticism that people express about Mercola. Mercola has become very controversial mm. because he's very, uh, you know, anti-vax and he's kind of taken a big, harsh stand at people. But still, he has some good information. Yeah. But by the same token, he has a big store. It's the yeah. same kind of skepticism. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's dig into the second half of this interview and uh, see what Dr. Brian has for us um, as we wrap things up with him. We'll catch okay. you guys on the other side. Okay. All right. You no, know, it just occurred to me, maybe I shouldn't have mentioned those people by name because they may, they're, they're powerful people with a big following. Maybe we'll interview one of them. We could always edit it out. Yeah. We're, that last I, bit, we can edit that last bit. I think we should. Yeah. Now that, because I don't want to be on the bad side of somebody that has a million followers. Yeah, although I don't think you said anything bad, but it, just to be on the safe side, we can, we can do that. We can be yeah. more general. I was being specific yeah. with names and everything. And yeah. Let's, yeah. let's make sure that we... Oh, now we're going to do this. Now we, we can talk about this. Okay. Yeah. So we're coming back in. So, so Jerry, um, just as a note, edit out the last minute or two when Adial went into his example of those. When, I, when I mentioned the names, <clears throat> uh, Dave Asprey, the Bulletproof guy, Ben Greenberg or Greenfield, maybe I even misspoke his name, a, uh, Timothy Ferris and Dr. Mercola, it only took about 60 seconds. Let's, let's take it out. Let's, yeah. let's include when I talk about where does the information come from and do we need to be skeptical about it? There are some interests behind it. But these specific names, I, I just realized we should, we should cut them out. Yeah, okay. All right, you ready to go into the back? <clears throat> I'm okay. ready. Here we go. And welcome back, everybody, to the Adiel Gorel Show. Just wrapping up here with Dr. Nathan Bryan. And, um, you know, he had a lot to say about this L-arginine thing we've been talking about. Uh, you know, basically was talking about if you take too much of it without the body's ability to convert it to nitric oxide, then we can actually create a negative effect in our body because we reduce our ability to convert nitric oxide from arginine so it seems that that's the rub there it's not that l-arginine is inherently by itself a problem no but it's that as we if we take too much of it or as we age and the like you're saying and the arginine pathway is breaking down then it's at one point not even going to do anything and even might be harmful depending on to the process harmful yeah. to the process of trying to <clears throat> convert um, into nitric yeah. oxide. So now I did ask him about fruit and he said, fruit are not a significant source of nitric oxide. So, I mean, fruit has, have their benefits, have the fiber, obviously. Antioxidants. I'm sorry? Antioxidants in the fruit. But yeah. we have to be aware of the sugar, obviously. But sure. when it's with fiber, I think it's okay. And then of course we went into how can we, is there a shortcut? He talked about a lozenge. 
Mm -hmm. As it happens, because you and I are such seekers, I already had it because one of the people that we'll interview in the future, John Sodery, talked about it. He talked about arginine maybe not being effective mm. and recommended this, and I got it uh, to try. Neo, Neo 40. 40. Yeah. You know, now, I didn't, I, I've been using it a little bit. I didn't feel, an, didn't feel an effect, but you and I talked about it. Maybe you, you, you don't feel an effect. But I've been taking them about once a day. And you know mm -hmm. what? I'll take one right now. So here it is. This is this is this is Ariel's equivalent of the COVID shot. <laughs> Here we go. On camera. On camera. So I mean. Now uh, is the nitric is the nitric oxide bubbling through your nostrils now? What's happening? No. There's nothing. I can't tell. Well, one thing I can tell you is feedback, which, I, it's too sweet. Mm. Now they say they don't put in extra sugar. But I think what they use is uh, stevia. Oh, yeah. make it, okay, I can't really fault them because they want to sell it to the public. Yeah. And the public cares about taste very much. Well, and the public is not as committed to mastering the art of bitters as you are. So <laughs> maybe you've developed too much of the bitter part and now everything's too sweet, you know? They talked about a sweet tooth. I have a bitter tooth. <laughs> you have a bitter tooth. I'm just a bitter old man. Yeah. Well, we should actually talk to that person though, whoever, someone to talk about the bitters, because that would be an interesting interview. So my amazing nutritionist, Crispin Sullivan, uh, didn't want to go on the TV show Life 201 because she's busy following the research, working with her clients, but maybe she will want to be interviewed. But if she says no, I, we can still find an expert on bitters and talk about yeah. that. But in any case, there's the lozenge. He was saying that even some famous people who got sick with COVID use the lozenge as part of their regimen mm. of healing. That was I interesting. Can't prove yay or nay, but that's what he said. And then he talked about beet powder. And again, you see it all over TV, beet powders, but you can get beet powder on Amazon or on any other place, you know. Yeah. But that's interesting. Or you can just eat beets. Eat beets, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, one thing that I recently did, which was interesting, I have a friend who is Chinese and very into the Chinese medicine and all. And my friend visited me and they saw that I was eating a big salad with my dinner, a big salad and some protein. And they said, your salad looks unbelievable. It's amazing. It's so varied and amazing. But I do have to make a comment. Mm. According to Chinese medicine, this is the winter now. We are now speaking and it's getting to be winter. It's getting to be winter soon. Yeah. And during the winter, you don't want to have cold salads, a salad that was in your fridge. Mm -hmm. Let's assume you don't make it super fresh. It's in the fridge from yesterday. It's cold. They said in the winter and the more it gets to be cold and some of our viewers are on the East Coast, mm -hmm. you want to have something else. So what I did was I, instead of having the salad, I wrote a list of veggies, a long list, a beets, and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts and some ginger, which is not really, I mean, it, it, it's a root, many things. And I made, or at least I asked somebody to make it for me, a stir fry. Mm. It was easy to do, mm -hmm. delicious and warm. And I could intuitively even tell. Mm -hmm. I was liking it better when it was cold outside. Yeah. So that you can get it, your veggies, not necessarily from a salad that's cut and cold. You can do stir fry, you can do a wok fry, so many ways to get all of that stuff. What I've been doing is, and I'll, on one of our next episodes, I'll bring the book and show you. 
but uh, I've been making these bowls. That's what they call them, bowls. So you can heat, you can warmed rice and broccoli and cauliflower, and and then they make a tahini dressing that you put on top of it. Mm. And so it's a warm, but it, they're vegan. You know, they're all vegan bowls, and and but you get tons of fiber and vegetables, and but they're warm. So yeah, there's a lot of creative ways to get vegetables out there. And I remember. <clears throat> Uh, what's her name? Um, uh, anyway, it's Jerry. Se I can't remember Jerry Seinfeld's wife. I can't remember her first name, but remember she came out with that cookbook years ago because she couldn't get her kids to eat greens. So she found a way to make like fudge out of spinach. Is just, right. So she would take all this spinach and she would, you know, chop it up or whatever, blend it and pulver, pulverize it and then she would add the cacao and whatever else, I don't know what goes in the recipe. But anyway, her kids were eating these brownies and these, and they were made of spinach. And so it was like a creative way to get kids to eat healthy. So if you really wanna get creative, you can do it. Yeah, absolutely. And so, but he talked about Still though, you talk about your shakes. You talk about, I have the equivalent of a shake. It's not quite a shake, but it's very similar. So it would be nice to know about powders that are right there. You know, many people now already know the art of taking a healthy vegetable, dehydrating it. Mm -hmm. So just the water goes out. And the process of dehydration can be made so there are no residues. Mm -hmm. Now you have powder. Just add water. Really? Yeah. It's so like those could. Jetson cartoon shows, you know, from like where they used to have a little pill and you'd add a drop of water and then a turkey dinner would show up. There you go. <laughs> so, I mean, those powders. So, yeah, you did talk about beet powders. And yeah. there are many beet powders available out there. There are uh, powders for cruciferous vegetables, which a lot of people are not as keen to eat. You can add them to your shake. The beauty of shakes and those things, they mask some of the tastes that you're not crazy about. Yeah. So even if you put kale and broccoli, it's not going to taste good. But then you put an apple and a piece of carrot and all of a sudden. Now, yeah, I know glycemic index and all of that. But shakes have a great way of masking what you don't really want to taste. Well, what you, what, what's also great about shakes, and not just shakes, but juices also, is that you can um, get an enormously, uh, a greater density of the vitamins and the antioxidants in a juice or a shake than you could possibly eat. Like you just couldn't eat that much. When, I'm, when I do juicing, I do green juicing every day. And so when I green juice, I have two different types of kale. I have celery, apple, lemons, ginger, turmeric, cucumbers, you know, and if you looked, actually, I took a picture, I should try to find it, of my juicing area just before I juice, okay? And you see this, and it's a mountain of vegetables. And I only get, you know, the equivalent of four juices out of it. But they're so dense and rich. Uh, and that's some of the benefits. But ironically, we're talking about the benefits of juicing from a nutrient density. But Dr. Brian brought up again in your interview the importance of chewing food. Right. And right from a nitric oxide perspective, I know James Nestor talked about that. Patrick McEwen talked about that. And not just chewing food, but Dr. Brian also talked about the importance of chewing slowly. And this, which you don't do with a shake. We hear it everywhere. Everywhere you go, exercise. Uh, you know, move, eat vegetables green ve you hear yeah. and now also we always hear chew your food properly people used to when i was a kid people say chew it 40 times 20 yeah. times i have to say and confess to you chad this is one area where i really suck yeah i suck not great that. either <laughs> I, i'm a two chewer two chew swallow i'm done i inhale my food it's just my personality. I'm like, I look at it, I get excited. I just inhale it. And I, I, with my ex-wife, I used to sit and she would eat about 10 times slower than me. 
I will be completely done. She wouldn't even start. Sometimes we even made joke. We said like, imagine it was a CSI mystery. There was a murder. The forensic guy comes and says, clearly the person here never touched their food that, oh, she already <laughs> ate half of me, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this is for me at least, you know, an area where I need to greatly improve. Yeah. Well, me too. I have the same issue. I eat way too fast. Um, since actually um, we interviewed James and, and Patrick, I've been making a concerted effort to chew slowly, but admittedly I do it for the first minute or two, then I forget I'm doing it, and then I finish the meal in two seconds. So right. well, that's <laughs> so. why the, the, the famous uh, Chinese, you know, few men chew, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so but, they should, but they should, <laughs> but they should. But you know, we, we also, uh, there's an interview with the uh, you know, urban monk, yeah. and one of the things that he was talking about is looking at your food, feeling your food, being thankful for, again, thankful for your food, mm. all the religions, you know, thank you. Every, so it's all about attention. Yeah. And he talked about take one meal a day, just one. And yeah. during that one meal at least, don't glance at your phone. Don't look at the TV in the background. Don't read the newspaper. And I have to say, for me, out of all the things we talk about, this is my weakest. Mm. You know, another way to reframe it, though, Adiel, that I've been thinking about for myself is um, rather than seeing it as like a bunch of tactics, like don't chew fast or don't eat this, or whatever. There's this movement that's kind of started up over the last few years. It came out of the mindfulness and the meditative space called slow living. And there's a real push for I, I just think as a society, things are happening so fast. The pace is so fast that there's a real sense in, if we're really honest with ourselves and like our viewers, you know, take a minute and just think about this. You're probably having the same experience. There's a real sense that we need to slow down. Like we're almost missing out on life because we're too goal focused. And it's just, you know, whatever it takes to get there, get there as fast as possible. And it's like the end justifies the means. And I think what we're seeing from a lot of these wellness experts and meditating people that we're talking to and whatnot is that actually the end probably doesn't justify the means because the means to get there means being unhealthy, being unhappy, being exhausted just to get to the goal. Losing your friends, maybe not having a good relationship, because you're yeah. always busy. You know, it remind, this is so true, but it's become an obsession. So if you look at a Gen Z person, which I know you know, you know a couple of those, yeah. as do I, this is the obsession. This mm. is the obsession. It's like, yeah. what, you're not gonna check your Instagram account for one second? How, how could you do that? There's no way yeah. you, you wanna. So, I mean, th this stimulus becomes very addictive you you need yeah. the stimulus slowing down again i bring the analogy that we talked about about the kid mm. the kid is playing enjoying the game and then the you know the parent says it's time to go to bed it's time to go to bed mm. and the kid said no i don't want to go to bed mm. i understand you understand why they don't want to go to bed they're engrossed in the game the truck is going the barbie doll whatever it is they love the game they don't want to go to sleep yeah. But in a way, this same struggle is within us every day. Mm -hmm. I want to look at my phone. I want to get an email. Oh, I got a new email. I got a phone call. Let's call my friend. Let's go hiking. Let's go lifting. Let's go biking. Now we have some time. Let's watch the new Netflix movie, yeah. The Queen's Gambit. I'm being in it. And now, oh, now it's time to go to bed. I'm almost reluctant. What? I have to close my eyes and go to sleep. Well, but it, it's really... A, a, day full of this little child who doesn't want to go to bed. So again, that's why meditation and slowing down and mindfulness is becoming so big mm -hmm. because the, you know, the parent in us needs to be able to tell the kid in us, you can go to sleep, you can take a nap, you can stop. And you're right, Chad. I mean, let's say that your goal was to become a billionaire. Mm -hmm. That was your goal. And you absolutely went crazy and went whole hog 
and you achieved it. You achieved it. You are now, your company just went public and now you're a billionaire, Richard. Congratulations. Okay, now what? Yeah. Your goal has been achieved. You're a billionaire. Okay, okay. So you're not going to have financial worry for the rest of your life and your family. Okay, good. That's nice. I like it. I'm not, not, but now what? What? When you wake up in the morning, do you wear a hundred pairs of pants or do you just wear one? Mm -hmm. Do you eat one breakfast or do you eat 1600 breakfasts? Yeah. What changes now? No, you're a billionaire. Okay, very good, Chad. What, what does it really mean? You have a billion dollars in the bank. Yes, you bought the dream home. Yes, you don't have to fly commercial. I understand. Okay, tell me what's next. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's funny you bring that up. Years ago, I had the chance to um, have lunch with um, a friend of mine who was, who's now passed, but he was a billionaire. He was worth about $1.1 billion. And I asked him over lunch, I just was so curious. I said, would you do it over again? You know, what it took for you to get here? And he said, absolutely not. He said, the relationships I had to destroy the corners I had to cut, the stress I put my body under wasn't worth it. Now that was just him. I'm not speaking for all billionaires. Who of course, some people. because you know, nowadays you have billionaires and they, they, you know, the person could be a mere 35 year old, yeah. but still healthy from being young and also goes to the gym and he's, you know, generally healthy. And then the company goes public and overnight, one day, that was like seven billion dollars. Yeah. You know, the guy, the guy who sold um, Inst, uh, WhatsApp. The guy, there were two guys, but one of them, yeah. his first name is Jan. He sold WhatsApp to Facebook, and he became worth. He was worth six to seven billion dollars right on the spot. He was very young. He's still probably worth that much. Yeah. So he didn't give up a lot necessarily. It was an idea that came right. Facebook bought him. So he not, didn't necessarily have to sacrifice. But going back to your friend, mm. the 1.1 billion guy, I guess I wonder what would have happened if he only got to be worth 30 million, not, not a billion one, 30 million. Mm -hmm. You could say, would he have sustained good relationship, good health and everything in a quest to be worth 30 million? I'm just picking a number yeah. from air. And 30 million is still quite a nice, big, strong, good number, which is almost, almost guaranteed yeah. to give him a life of comfort and not worrying about stuff. Kids want to go to college here, want to buy a nice home. Yeah, maybe he's not going to buy the $100 million home. Okay. But, you know, can buy a nice... Sure. And so maybe that is, would have been a, worthy, a more worthy goal because one of the things that's very cynical, but it's true, that you don't uh, take it with you when you go. Yeah, no, you don't. And I don't think it's even uh, the problem of whether it's a billion or 10 million or whatever. It's more going back to the slow living topic. It has more to do with just getting a pace with your life that is sustainable, that fulfills you, that doesn't burn you out. You still might become a billionaire, no problem. But it's the, it's the corners that, in this case, my friend felt that he had to cut because he made time for nothing else. Didn't see his kids growing up. They were teenagers by the time he realized he had kids. <laughs> you know what I mean? That kind of thing. So, yeah. Um, so, well, we've got a break for this episode. Um, and um, thanks everybody for tuning in and, and uh, tune in next week um, where uh, we'll be talking about similar types of in-depth conversations, um, perhaps with an expert, perhaps with Adiel and I, um, just kind of going through some of the stuff that uh, we've learned over the years. But until then, we're happy that you've joined us and we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for joining me today. Click the subscribe button for more video. Got a question or comment? I love questions and comments. Leave yours below. And here's another video you've got to see.